Chris, welcome to Consulting Logistics. How's it going? Good, good. Good to be here again. Yeah, absolutely. And I think today's going to be a fun conversation, sort of a follow up to what we talked about last week, which was all about how you optimize freight uh, using data. So I had Steve Ryan, our data scientist, sit down and talk to me about all the algorithms and stuff. But now I actually want to talk to someone who actually uses this stuff. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit, give a little background to me, what you did before, kind of what you're doing now in terms of negotiating contracts. How, do, how does that all work? What's your role within Aborn in that? Yep. So, you know, pr previously in my career, I was responsible for negotiating the commercial aspect uh, of contracts across all modes. So you're talking international ocean, international air freight, small package, LTL, truckload, intermodal. So really every mode of transportation. Uh, and here at Aborn, we're doing the same thing on behalf of our clients. So, you know, I'd have to say in the span of my career, I've, I've negotiated, you know, well over 100 different contracts across all modes. Jeez. Now, how many do you typically do kind of a year here at Aborn? Because that's one of the more interesting things is we just we get so much more practice than a usual shipper. So how much right. are you kind of estimating you would do it per year? So there's there's different types of negotiations that happen. If we just look at our standard, say we have a new client, you know, one of the first things that we ultimately end up doing on behalf of our clients is negotiating a new contract for them, depending on the modes, whether it's LTL, truckload, whatever it might be. So there you have one type of negotiation. And for existing clients, you've got pricing that's going to be coming due, say on an annual basis. So as that pricing comes due, we make a collective decision with the client. Do we want to go out to the greater market and do a full-blown RFP? Do we want, are we happy with the service that the incumbents are providing? Do we just want to go back to incumbents and negotiate just with the incumbents um, and, and, you know, try to either absorb some sort of nominal price increase or, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to reduce costs as well just with your incumbents. And then there's a third type. And that's when we see, and this is happening right now as we speak, where you've negotiated pricing on behalf of the clients. They've made their selections on which carriers they want to partner with. Um, and, you know, usually in a broker environment, some of the underlying asset carriers may now not be committing to the rates that they had previously committed to. So in that case, we need to go out and we need to source another carrier as a replacement. So it's not a full-blown RFP, but the mechanics of it are exactly what you do in an RFP. You take that lane, you take the volume, you either negotiate with the other incumbents or you push it out to, to the greater market. So right now, as we speak, I've got two you know, full-blown RFPs, an LTL and a truckload right now. And I have seven other more along the lines of a carrier replacement RFP happening right now. Jeez. So I guess kind of going into the topic for today, it sounds like, especially that third kind of scenario, it sounds like data becomes a critical element because if you're going to have to go with like an asset carrier saying like, hey, I can't do this, and you're starting from scratch, it becomes like almost like, oh my God, I got to do this whole thing again. But let's talk about, I guess, data and how we're starting to use this. Because it was something I found super interesting when Steve Ryan was talking about it, of like, it goes into a negotiation. So right. what are we doing before? How do you consider, like, what is rich data that you consider to have before a negotiation? Yeah, it, when it's a great question. And what we struggle with typically is if we have a new client more often than not, the data that they're able to provide us to be able to go to RFP is not all that great. And that's very typical of a lot of shippers out there. So unless you have a TMS in place and a pretty robust ERP, you're going to be pulling data from multiple um, origins, whether it's from a carrier, maybe you do have some data internally, we'll pull all that data together and we'll do a freight profile. And that just sort of tells the client, hey, this is your DNA as the data shows us today. This is the story that it's telling us. Now, once we've onboarded a client and we have them in our TMS, then we get some really rich data. So if we look at, you know, less than truckload space, you know, you want your OD pairs. So you pick up in your delivery locations. Um, you know, you want to know the weight of the shipment. You want to know the number of skids. You want to know the number of pieces on there. Um, and a lot of that data, you're just not able to get from the client side of things. So from an LTL perspective, you know, and where LTL is going, one of the other critical elements is going to be, you know, what are the dimensions of a pallet? Right, and right. none of our shippers today have the ability to provide that. They can say on average, yeah, everything ships on a 48 by 40 pallet and it's normally about 60 inches high, you know, but that's a pretty generic anecdotal statement. Um, so unless they have the dimensionalizers in-house, you can't get that data. Right. And, you know, the future of LTL pricing could go to dynamic pricing. 
Um, and that would be a critical data element. So there's a big question out there. There's a big problem out there that we need to help our clients solve. So when you say, and this is going on script, but when you say it's bad data that usually we get when we're first coming in because they don't have that, it's bad in the sense that it's all different, right? Yeah. So if you're getting data from disparate origin locations, you know, from a carrier, they may have a format and even carriers within the same mode. So you could go to say a UPS freight, just an example, and um, say, send me all of our shipment data for the past 12 months. Then you go to XPO and you ask them for that. The format that it can comes back in may not be the same. So right, we right. need to try to smooth that out, so to speak. Um, and then some carriers are going to have really lousy data uh, as well. They're not as mature as some of the other, say, LTL carriers that we just mentioned. So kind of sticking with that, what can a shipper, I guess, do? Oh, wow. Sorry. <laughs> uh, distracted by the, <laughs> for some reason, the cops are coming on this road. Um, what can a shipper do? Uh, right. Like, what would your advice to a shipper if they're like, hey, I need, I want to start getting a handle on this. Is it just like you say, contact your, your carriers and just get that there and then come up with sort of the metrics you want or what should they kind of be thinking? Yeah. If you don't have any data internally, the only place you're going to be able to get it from is your carriers. So, you know, depending on the mode, there's different data points that you want to make sure that you're getting. Um, you know, in a small package environment, there's literally dozens upon dozens of data points that both UPS and FedEx will capture. Uh, there's certain critical ones that you want to ask them for, and they have all this data. Um, they're both just, they drag their feet a little bit on providing that. Right, you know, right. They do have CAN reports online that you can run. Uh, some of them are, can be pretty useful and some of them are pretty useless. And right. that's, that's very intentional as well. Uh, so it depends on the mode, uh, but there would be some very critical data points uh, that you would want your carriers to be able to provide. So data is great and all, but it's also useless if you can't gain any insights. And you kind of get the insights by like coming up with metrics. So what are important metrics to have prior to a negotiation? What are something to calculate? Like what should you be trying to like measure? Yeah, for us, you know, we cost is always an important aspect, right? So we want to make sure that we're negotiating pricing that's competitive with the market as we see it today. Uh, service should be paramount for just about every shipper. Right. Um, getting service level metrics prior to a negotiation are difficult unless you're in a TMS. Um, you know, things like rejection rates, you know, if you're tendering something out to a truckload carrier and they're the primary, uh, how often are they rejecting those? You know, very difficult to do without a TMS. Uh, are they picking up on time? Are they delivering on time? Are they making appointments? Again, these are all very granular data points that really don't exist uh, outside of a TMS. So those things that end up being very critical, um, you, you typically don't see right out of the gate in that first negotiation. Right, okay. Sorry, I'm just thinking about all that stuff because like when so like what is there like a good metric when it comes to like service level or is it basically because you can't capture that stuff because it's all kind of happening just like that too quick to really sit there and as a person remember this carrier rejected this and then I went to this one like that's the whole reason why the TMS becomes so big. Yeah, absolutely. So what we what we typically see with a lot of clients that are new is they tend to speak in in a bit of an anecdotal format right. um, because they don't have the data to really support. So we hear a lot of always and never. So these things always happen and no, that never happens. And usually the truth is somewhere in the middle, right? Yes. So one person may have a viewpoint of a carrier saying they're always late. They always have damages. They always do this. Well, in this carrier over here, they never do these things. Well, it's never that extreme, right? right, right. So there's, there's probably some middle point in there that's really a better version of the truth. And that's where data coming out of a TMS can really change the narrative. And you can have a very granular understanding on the operations of the carrier and the performance of the carrier. So why is it more important to have like a data-driven story when it comes to starting your negotiations? Well, your data tells you who you are and how you're operating. Um, you know, if I look at a small package environment, so I actually just had uh, a meeting with a client and we were going through their small package data. Um, and, you know, I broke down all their charges by service type. So they really didn't have a good understanding that of how much of their product was being shipped in an express service. So I see a small package shipping to zone two and zone three, which are going to be the closest delivery points to your shipping point, And they're using express services when a ground service is going to make the same transit time. 
Um, but it's just having that knowledge on the ground. Uh, same thing on the international side, uh, you know, shipping a ton of product international priority when international economy, uh, based on where they're delivering to, uh, it's a $50 reduction in the cost per package, and that's going to meet the same service standards. Um, so a lot of it, they just don't know. Shipping first overnight, that's a guaranteed service by 8.30 a.m., uh, where they're receiving no discounts. So they, they're paying whatever the published rate is. You know, and the the pressure test there is, do you really need a package by eight thirty a.m.? Right. You know, your um, your early a.m. delivery would be ten thirty. Do you even really need it by ten thirty? Your standard overnight service is going to be by three p.m. Is that satisfactory? Because it seems like it would be to me. Um, you know, your first overnight cost per package on average for them was one hundred and thirty dollars. Your priority overnight was. $18.25 and your standard overnight was just under $18. So you're talking a $112 difference per package just by switching modes. Right. And they're not even aware that this is happening. Um, and a lot of it is just because they just don't have the bandwidth to really get underneath their own hood and figure out what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. How do you identify that stuff? That's always the tricky thing with data, right? Is like the unknown that you don't even know to ask about. Like how do you... Is it really just set in your metrics, like very clear and like, here's the insights I want to gain from my shipments or how do you, what yeah. do you do? In the, in the small package environment, as long as you can get the data from a UPS or FedEx, the, the data is going to be right there and right. it's going to very clearly tell you who you are and how you operate. Now, putting that data um, in, in this specific instance, we're talking 80,000 lines of data, putting that in a digestible format where somebody can just visually see, this is what I'm doing, mm -hmm. this doesn't make any sense, and here are your opportunities to put internal controls in place to help reduce overall cost. And we haven't even started talking about rates, right? <laughs> this is just pure operations right. and who you are and the changes you need to make to help pull money out of your transportation spend. So small package data, it's, it's obviously a lot different than LTL or truckload. Uh, but that was one example that jumped out at me. So to me, if I'm hearing you correctly, the before the negotiation, what rich freight data tells you is where you can pull money out. It could. Yeah. In a small package environment, absolutely. Right. Um, and it really just, it gives you the understanding on who you are. Right. right. So where do we, I have bad practices? That, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. We had another potential client where we looked at 120,000 lines of data. Uh, and this client was really only operating with uh, national carriers, right? So the, the thought of a regional-based LTL carrier never even got on their radar because it's not something they really had any experience and knowledge about. We looked at the data, and because there was such high density in different um, in different regional areas, it made perfect sense to introduce regional carriers. Right. Um, so that, you know, we were able to present to them, this is your DNA, this is what you're doing today, and there's a way to operate more efficiently that will result in less damages and a more competitive cost. So just understanding who you are, it sounds like it's not a big deal, but it's really everything when you go into negotiations. Yeah. So let's go into negotiations then. How do you utilize data within negotiations? That was something Ryan and Steve talked about is being able to kind of look at what the fair market rates are. Is that sort of what we're using with during negotiations or how do we use data? Yeah, so we have data, um, we have shipment level data that we'll use, obviously, that helps create that whole DNA profile that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But there's also outside tools that we use uh, to measure market level data. So we can do an overlay and say in truckload space, um, you know, here's all their shipments for a calendar year. Here's all the lane pairs. You know, we can break that out. We break that out by region so we can see if they have pockets of, you know, significant density. And then we can actually overlay that across all of our other clients too, right? To see if there's any sort of commonality there where we can say to a specific carrier, hey, you're you're currently hauling freight for client X. I've got client Y who there's some nice uh, synergies that could operate right there. So it allows us to operate strategically with carriers. Uh, and then we can look at that market data and we can say, this is what their average cost is in this lane. Now let me look at what the greater market is tends to be paying. Right. And those are tools that we'll have access to that a shipper probably won't. Uh, so we can have a more holistic view on the overall marketplace as it relates to their specific shipments. What tools does a shipper have when it comes to data and during a negotiation? 
So the only tools that they would really have is their own market intelligence. Uh, They would have their own data so they know where they operate. Um, And then it's just a matter of do they understand how to operate strategically with carriers and take that data, like in the example um, that I was using before, if one of our clients, we know that one of our clients has a high density of shipments operating in New England, right? And now we may have another client um, who also has a similar footprint. Right? So we would look to some of those carriers that are already operating in there, look to see if we can match and map some synergies to that, right. and then help out this other client, really, because we have this client X that's already operating in that space. You know, Our, our clients won't have visibility to that. They're only going to really understand what's happening, hopefully, within their four walls. Right, right, right. Because yeah. they care about their DNA. They don't care yep. about how everything else, how the, right. how the uh, sausage is made, right? Right, right. What about... Um, can data get you in trouble during a negotiation? Can it tell you something like, is there something to kind of pitfalls that you watch out for? Or is it all kind of gravy? Like it's all rainbows. Yeah. It's well, it can really uncover some ugly stuff, right? you know, no question about it. Um, you know, so we will see from time to time, um, you know, a customer or a client may have this assumption that, hey, we're always shipping this, uh, you know, super dense freight, ton of it's long haul, you know, and then we go back in and we're like, well, there's an awful lot of short haul here. And you know what, a, a large percentage of your stuff are moving at an AMC, an absolute minimum charge in the LTL space. Um, and your absolute minimum charges are really uh, gross. They're too high, right? So right, right. you're really paying through the nose on a lot of these smaller shipments that you don't even know are happening today. So it can uncover some ugly truths, but it, it allows everybody to be transparent, right? Right. So if a carrier sees that there's going to be a lot of minis there, um, then it might help them to price more accordingly, you know, or at least it allows them to know that, hey, we know that there's a lot of minis and we don't want to pay this super high mini anymore. Uh, because we're going to have replacement options out there. All right. So trying to wrap up or kind of going more towards like the end of it all. I mean, again, it's like we talked about at the beginning. You want to know who you are and how you operate. So that's all the usual data you should be capturing regardless of negotiations are going right. on. But what happens post? Is there additional data sets now that you've signed the contracts, now that you have these rates in place, now that you've negotiated a more steady state type of contract. Is there new data pieces you should start gathering? Is this kind of what carrier scorecarding is? Yeah, yeah. Carrier scorecarding is critical. So that would go back to some of the things that we talked about earlier. You know, if if now let's say you're in that TMS environment and you can measure rejection rates, you can measure the on-time pickup, on-time delivery, damages, things like that. That's critical. And the carriers love this. They really do. Right. Like even if it doesn't paint the rosiest picture of them, they love to see it. Um, you know, part of our negotiation process that we put in place is we actually send out carrier scorecards during the negotiation. So let's say in a truckload um, RFP, we give carriers visibility to their numerical ranking for each lane in that RFP. So say there's 100 carriers that participate, they will see on a lane by lane basis whether they're ranked number two or number 100. Uh, and then we also give them a gap to how far off they are to the target rate. Right. And the feedback that we've gotten in the past year from the carriers has just been phenomenal. They're like, this is outstanding because it allows them to go back to pricing and say, hey, on average, you know, in this RFP, we're on average ranked 75th across all these lanes. There's something wrong with our pricing and how we're going about it. <laughs> right. It allows them to operate more efficiently, right. you know. And some carriers say, "Yeah, that's just our cost model. You know, it's just the way that we do. We're not going to be always cost competitive." And they, you know, back everything up on service. And we see that from time to time. More often than not, we see carriers go back who are uh, continually finishing high. Uh, in terms of cost and these RFPs, they go back to pricing. They say something's wrong here, right? Because right. we're way off from where everybody else is. So that's been very good as well. And I want the audience to know you're not being hyperbolic with any of this stuff. You truly talk to carriers every single day. You every were, single day. Every like I know, like half the time when they come to the website, I'm the one who's like chatting. Okay, talk to Chris. Like when you say that they actually like this, like you can name names off the top of your head absolutely. right now. Absolutely, like, absolutely. This has been so well received right. um, and, and it allows us to operate in our space differently from most third party freight management consulting companies. We're being completely transparent. We're agnostic to it, so to speak. So we wanna give them data. We wanna help them operate better. Uh, and it, again, it's been so well received. It's just been a really, really good thing. And we're gonna expand on this too, on what we're providing back to carriers. Nice. Uh, kind of last sort of two questions, but 
frequency. How often post the negotiations? How often should you as a like should you be scorecarding? How often should you be collecting this data? Because as we know, everyone's already overworked. So how do right. you kind of make sure that you're doing it at a time that's going to be beneficial and you're just not like man, I'm spending hours on this thing and the yeah. ROI is just not there. Right, right. I mean, in a perfect world, it would be great to meet with every carrier on a monthly basis and say, hey, you were awarded X amount of volume. Here's where you're trending towards that. Um, here's where you're short. Here's where you're over. Here's your on time, you know, scorecarding right. and all that. That's probably not realistic. You know, uh, here, just given the sheer number of clients and the number of carriers that are working with clients, you know, I wouldn't be able to get to it on a monthly basis. Quarterly feels right. Um, I would say at a minimum, you want to do it at least twice a year. Because if you wait a full year and you're going to give a carrier their scorecard at the end of an RFP, it's like, you know, trying to defuse a bomb that already went off. Right, right, right. So if they've been horrible all year, great. Now you're already going out to bid again. Slamming it on the table. Boom, you were horrible. Right. (laughs) It's pointless. (laughs) Yeah, and you're not giving the carrier an opportunity to correct itself. Right, right, right. right. So we have never been and never will be an advocate of if a carrier drops a load, you unplug them and plug in somebody else. You, You owe it to the carrier um, to allow them an opportunity to fix those fix those issues. And right. when they become repetitive issues, all right, then maybe it's time to talk about a mitigation plan, a change, whatever it's going to be, some sort of course correction. Um, but I would say at a minimum, you want to do it twice a year. Right. But ideally, it's once a month, but we get it. You're busy. But at the same yeah. time, like you say, the whole point of it all is really just continuing the conversation, keeping the communication channel alive in a way that's not just like, well, I kind of think you suck right now. And be <laughs> instead... Here's yeah. the actual DNA of how this is working out That's right now. That's exactly right. And, you right. know, the one thing that we always advise our clients is we want to get away from that anecdotal stuff. And you right, just right. want to hit them with facts, with data. So, hey, this is exactly what happened. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. I'm not trumping this up to make it worse than it right, really right. is. I'm just giving you a very clear picture of where you are. Uh, and you should also be able to show where they are against all their other competition that's currently moving freight for them. So yeah. it's a good thing for carriers. Uh, final thing, pay me a picture. What's a successful negotiation look like if you've used rich freight data? What should it look like? What should a shipper kind of see with this whole thing? Yeah. If you have rich data during the RFP process, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see carriers come back um, with some very sharp pricing because they have a clear picture on what the freight looks like, where it's moving, how it's going to handle if we're talking about LTL. Um, so you will have the right mix of service with carriers, you know, in the LTL space, like we talked about, maybe it's introducing some more regional carriers. You're going to have the right service commitments without question at the right price. Um, And then you'll also hopefully reduce things like damages and claims and things like that, that non-value add stuff where it just takes time, you know, to pull together all those claims uh, when you could be focused on, you know, more value add type work. So, you know, less handling, less claims, sharper pricing, better service. It's awesome. Uh, That's great. I think we'll wrap up. uh, As usual, tell people where they can kind of contact you. But also, I mean, the one thing that you kind of really hit on hard at the beginning was like, it's hard, like as a shipper, you kind of, you're sort of put in a box. But the one thing that like is great about what you can provide is a true spend analysis that's looking at market pricing and stuff like that. So talk a little bit about like what a shipper, if they are interested, could reach out to you and kind of what they could expect to receive for free from like a spend analysis. Yeah. uh, You know, we, we love data. Uh, We'd love to get our hands on data. If you're able to provide us data, provide me data, I can go through and I can, you know, digest that, analyze that and give you, Hey, this is your DNA as the data suggests today. You know, the best way to reach me is, is email at cpeckham at abornandco.com. Um, I'm available all the time. I do a really lousy job of unplugging. Um, <laughs> yep. so I'm, I'm constantly, <laughs> constantly monitoring the emails. That's the best way to get a hold of me. But yeah, I, I'd love to analyze data. I'd love to help out anybody that's struggling with RFPs and really just getting the, getting the ball rolling. Yeah. You know, you're I, just, you're transparent and honest about it. You're not going to make anyone feel bad. Yeah. <laughs> you, you sitting on this podcast and let me ask dumb questions all the time. <laughs> I, I, going back to the days when I was on the shipper side of the desk, there were just there were plenty of times where I employed third party help because honestly, I just couldn't get to it. I knew there was something there. Um, I couldn't quantify it, but I knew it was there. But I needed somebody who could be more singularly focused on getting in the weeds, and that's what we're here for. That's what right. I'm here for. 
Awesome, Chris. So I'll include your email in the show notes. So people listening to this, watching it, there's definitely a way. Just go down in the description to see what how to email Chris. Again, cpeckham at abornandco.com. Uh, otherwise, man, thanks for joining me. Thanks for sitting down, dude. Yeah, no worries, man. It's always a good time. Always. How do you currently collect data on your freight? Leave a comment in the video and let me know. In the meantime, enjoy past episodes of Consulting Logistics and subscribe to us by clicking the subscription button. Thanks for watching Consulting Logistics. I'm Kyle McNaught. Peace.